Resident Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Blake Riquetta joins us from Santa Monica, California, where he is Chairman and CEO of Sonnen, the global energy storage company. Sonnen was founded in 2010 in a small town in southern Germany, its founders driven by the desire to create a clean and affordable energy future for everyone through their Sonnen battery. At a time when solar energy was only fed into the grid, they created a system that allows households to store and consume their self-generated energy day and night. Today, the company, which has been a subsidiary of Shell since 2019, is a global leader in energy storage solutions with offices in Germany, Italy, Great Britain, Australia, and the U.S. Our guest today, whose career includes stints at Lutron and Tesla, joined Sonnen six years ago as VP of Sales quickly moving up the ranks to Senior Vice President and now Chairman and CEO. He's here today to discuss his career, the latest energy storage developments, and the business opportunities that are available to custom integrators interested in working with Sonnen toward the energy transition. Blake Riquetta, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we'll talk at length about Sonnen and the uh, energy storage technology solutions that you uh, provide in the energy transition. But um, a lot of our audience, as you know, is um, in the custom integration or CDA channel. Uh, and I'd like to just start maybe a little bit more about your background, specifically how you got going with the lighting control technology pioneer Lutron in Pennsylvania. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about how you first connected with Lutron and what if any interest in tech you had in college or even as a kid? <clears throat> sure. Thank you. Great question. Well, again, thanks for having me on the show. This will be a fun conversation. So Lutron was basically my heart since I was very, very young. I came out of university and Lutron was my first job out of college. I went through the classic and well-known Lutron training program for young people, which was one of the best in the industry, I believe and produced a lot of great leaders. Off the top of my head, Ron Callis, I know, is quite well known in the industry. He was literally one class away from me in the Lutron training program. And I was a Lutronite for 15 years, and I didn't think that I would ever leave Lutron. And so it really was a big imprint on my life. And my whole career there was spent developing the Radio Raw business platform, which in the early days, was very much a, a young and small business, this relatively pioneering idea of radio frequency based lighting control back when Lutron was first getting into it. And to answer your question, I didn't really have any interest in college necessarily for lighting control, lighting, home automation, any of those things. But when I was interviewing various companies out of university, Lutron was just by far and away my favorite offer that I received. But from the age of 20, to 35, that was home. <laughs> and you, where did you actually grow up then to end up in Pennsylvania? I was in North Carolina. I went to Pennsylvania to play tennis for Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania in Erie. And so in one of the career fairs that I went to, there was a Lutron call out because Lutron was ranked at that time something like top 100 companies in America to work for. And I can't remember exactly what magazine this was but i picked up a magazine at a career fair <laughs> and there was the, and i i think i sent my resume to most of the companies in the magazine and of course being based in pennsylvania i was able to connect with them i think relatively easily but the interview process for a young person was quite rigid still at lutron and you're we were talking before we recorded uh you properly pronounced, I, I can barely say properly pronounced, <laughs> my <laughs> my last name, my Polish last name. And I remembered reading in your uh, LinkedIn profile that you'd spent a little time in Poland. So what was your internship in um, during that time? Well, what an interesting question. Yeah. So I went to Poland. I went to Italy for a study abroad. Then I went to Poland for my work abroad. And it was, I was working for a company called Huta Florian, which is a steel company in the south of Poland in Silesia in a region property, properly pronounced in Polish, the Slaunsk, and the city was Sventohovice, which is this 
little place by Katowice, which is a, a big steel city. So old steel, Polish steel industry. And my job was as an intern, right, to effectively do whatever I could to add value. But I was also trying to, back then it was still early days, so I was trying to teach the American system of business and the actually the market economy system. So I wrote a a little manual for them called Amerikanski System Prowadzenia Fermi, I think. So it's like basically like American business, I think, structures. And, and anyway, it was a wonderful experience and it definitely put an imprint on me. <laughs> well, it sounds like it. And you got a chance to work on your languages, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> your Italian uh um, last name, your Polish uh, ability there, really impressive. Those two. Well, yeah, but only I only speak English to be clear, and I that's the other languages I work hard on, but they are limited at best. You, you've got good pronunciation, at least yeah, when thanks. you have to. Well, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, you left Lutron then, um, jumping back into the career here uh, in 2016 or so, and you went to Tesla. So what was that's that's a pretty pretty progressive move to. Um, do Powerwall sales for them. What what was that? You never thought you'd leave Lutron. So what brought you to Tesla? Yeah, I really didn't. In fact, I, in so many ways, had already planned and some of the great leaders there, my mentors, Michael Smith, David Weinstein, Mike Piscina, these kind of guys. Well, I was planning on what my where my office in CB3, Coopersburg 3, which is the building where these offices are, where I would be when I moved back to Pennsylvania. Like I really was Lutronite for life. And Lutron's a special company. It's a great company. It's incredibly unique company. And so I thought this is really home. Now, the founder of Lutron, Mr. Spira, he passed away in 2015. And even though I didn't have tons of direct interaction with Mr. Spira, but every time I did interact with him, it was really special to me. And he, for some reason, and this isn't the case with everybody, especially engineers, he's very hard on engineers, but with me, he was really just incredible. And he was, even though I had everyday mentors like Michael Smith and David, this guy was like, I followed the belief in Mr. Spirit. And I couldn't actually imagine leaving the company and if he was still around. When he passed away, something was happening already in my career, which people, most people at Luchon, of course, didn't know, which was that the president of Bang & Olufsen, North America... Bang & Olufsen, if you may know, is high-end speakers and TVs and whatnot from Denmark. And they were a customer of Lutron's, and they were my customer at Lutron. And the president was a really passionate guy. Now, come to find out that Elon really loves their products and mm -hmm. loves their speakers and TVs and actually had an idea of making their stores, Tesla stores, a little bit more like a Bang & Olufsen store. This was kind of an idea concept. Anyway, long story long, the president of Bang & Olufsen North America was recruited to run Tesla's sales operations. Mm. And so he was basically going to be running all the Tesla stores around the world and trying to spruce them up a little bit and make them a little bit more, let's call it, I don't know, sexy. And, and this is not like, this story has got a lot of ins and outs to it, but this is right. my take. So when I found out that I had, well, back up. Basically, this guy, this president of Bank and & Olufsen and I remained friends, even when he went to Tesla. And I knew, some part of me knew that I wanted to make a bigger difference and not that Lutron's work is not extremely beneficial to the world. It is. But I thought, I really want to make an impact. And I've always been very passionate about clean energy and about fighting climate change. And people at Lutron knew that. I was a bought an electric car in 2011 when nobody had electric cars and this sorts of thing. And even when I got my 15 year service award at Lutron, Michael Smith may or may not remember, but he mentioned that in my, in the speech about me being this kind of environmentally focused guy. So I, I think I knew that I was probably going to have to leave Lutron at some point and to do something that I perceived was bigger in the impact long term. And when this guy who was president of Bang & Olufsen, who went to Tesla, Zian Nielsen, he effectively opened up the door. And when we la when Tesla launched Powerwall as a concept, and it gives us actually early 2015, late 2014, when the con maybe it was 2015, when the concept was introduced, when Elon went on stage, it was just an idea and it was an empty box. And fast forward, 
Tesla wanted a more, let's call it smart home feel to Powerwall. It was going to be the nucleus of the home. Hmm. And so Zian, who was from Bang & Olufsen, he could have done this, but he was already running the stores and he had all the stores worldwide. So it wasn't his thing to go, try to figure out this crazy new category called energy storage and make a home automation-esque battery in your house. So he said, of course, Blake, you should come do this. Hmm. So I left Lutron to go to Tesla specifically because Tesla was not necessarily looking for a solar guy. They wanted someone from kind of a more home automation background. Mm -hmm. So this was a radical change after 15 years. And I went from being a lighting control guy. You know, my last name, Raketa, in the CI industry was Raketa, where I changed my the I in Raketa to capital A for Radio Raw. <laughs> right? So... And Wells at Lutron, I had interacted with and, and trained over 4,000 integrators over the 15 years. And so there was really a lot of me in Lutron and in Radio Raw specifically. So for me to go to energy storage was just a massive shift. But I'm so, so happy that I did that because I don't think that my potential was even remotely close to being reached before that. Well, I, I feel like I'm doing this like step by step career thing with you, but I, I do think it's important to, to get us to where you are today. Um, you, you joined Sonnen in December of 2016. Um, when did you learn about this company and what was it that drew you to them versus where you, what you had been uh, doing there at Tesla? So the best way to describe it in a let's call it professional manner is that Tesla was very different than I thought and very different than Lutron. And the bottom line is that the organization is, I think, a force for good. And there are so many great people there. The CEO has a very different philosophy than what I learned at Lutron as my personal and business ethics. And, and it was very difficult for me to survive there, I didn't necessarily fit. And I knew that the work was good work and I could work really hard. But when it comes to corporate culture and ethics, this was a problem. So when we voted, when the Tesla board voted the acquisition of Solar City, November 17th, 2016, I knew that by that point I already knew I, I needed to go. Now in going, I could do two things. I could go back home, quote unquote, go back to Lutron. And say, oh, well, the whole clean energy thing was a one-year mistake. Or I could try again. And I had already been hearing inside Tesla about this incredibly innovative German company that had actually, and don't say this too loud back then, <laughs> been doing what we were trying to do with Powerwall for years. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, really? Americans clearly don't know this. And there's this company called Zonen in the German language, Zonen, which in, in English people say Sonnen. And what is this Zonen? So I start looking into it and it's incredible what they've achieved. They already have swarm control of batteries. They're already talking about replacing coal burning power plants with batteries. And the German market was already years ahead of the American market. This is the first time that I realized and learned that. So I reached out and tried to see if I could find a contact for someone in HR at Sonnen because I knew from one of the news articles there, Sonnen has always been a very, let's call it, what do they call it, a press darling. Hmm. But anyway, I thought, okay, and one of the articles about Sonnen, I knew that they were coming to the United States. I knew that they had a German CEO for the U.S. company that had had a short stint and was already leaving. Hmm. And I thought, okay, I mean, not that I was trying to be CEO back then. I had no idea that that could ever happen. Yeah. And so I got in and the fact that I ran Powerwall sales for North America for Tesla, knowing Sonin knew that Tesla was in a strange way the incumbent, even though Sonin had been doing energy storage for years and Tesla had not. But Tesla's an American company with an endlessly powerful brand mm -hmm. and it's going to be successful the day they ship the first Powerwall, which we were. Anyway, so long story long. I reached out, found them, and I remember when the founder of Zonin and the first chief sales officer that I was working for years ago, seven years ago, yeah, seven years ago, yeah, seven years ago, uh, flew in to California to interview me. 
wow, was that something? And I knew I was like, this is the company. This place is where I need to be. And back then it was a little baby. And I always think about it in, in terms of Lutron size, which I won't talk about because I know that's actually confidential. But mm-hmm. I thought about, wow, this is so little. And then, you know, last year when we just topped 400 million euro and, you know, literally next year we're supposed to be a billion. Mm. And it's unbelievable the size change that's happened since then. So anyway, I think it's been a very good journey and it was the right place to be. and It was the right home. Yeah, give it a little bit of context on why Germany um, was was more progressive with the with the battery storage kind of concept with uh, energy transition. Is it because of that that dependency on fossil fuels from other places that are a little more volatile that they kind of want to pull away, or uh, something about their climate? What what is it about Germany that they they were kind of willing to dive into this earlier? That's a great question. Yeah. You see a lot of Western countries that are a bit more, let's call it forward, than the United States has been on clean energy and embracing renewable energy, but Germany is always number one. So you see big players, Japan, Australia, Germany, Italy, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Belgium. So, But why is Germany number one in that whole group? Well, in Germany, there's a lot of political will both on the left and the right. So even if you're in, for instance, the Christian Democratic Party, the party of Angela Merkel, and, or if you're on the Social Democrats, so Olaf Scholz, who's the current chancellor, it doesn't matter. Both sides are environmentally forward. Hmm. And there's no, so, so you have massive political will. You'd have to go to like extremist parties to not be interested in the environment. And so with that, what do you get? You get legislation. So the Bundestag, which is their like Congress, passed a landmark legislation called the Anoyabara and the Getham Gazettes in 2001. And this changed the entire clean energy industry globally forever. It was a massive scheme to uh, push the adoption of solar, where every electron, a kilowatt hour you export into the grid in Germany, you would get 200% of the retail price. So, you know, if it was 15 cents a kilowatt hour, you're getting paid 30 cents a kilowatt hour to put it in the grid. So every little house, every, you know, farmer with a barn starts putting up solar in Germany and then wind turbines as well. People put up wind turbines everywhere. The government put a a ton of investment in wind turbines on the North Sea, around Denmark. And so you start getting this massive ascent to clean energy in the German system, the energy system. And that caused a lot of problems. And those are problems that you start seeing very logically in other countries that follow Germany. And now in the United States, we see the exact same problems in California, not in the other 49 states yet. And these problems have to do with the very nature of renewable energy being variable, being intermittent and erratic, Mm -hmm. being even volatile when it crashes into the grid just because it's windy or just because it's sunny. And then when it's gone, poof, when the sun goes down or when the wind stops blowing and people not understanding potentially in the voters, not understanding that the grid itself, we could call it the enemy, the old grid, the coal burning power plant based grid and even natural gas power plants are still spinning turbines. They're dispatchable spinning turbines that are synchronous, that are grid forming. They're steam that moves a wheel, right? Moves mm-hmm. a giant turbine. And what does that mean? Well, it's it's a very logical, well thought out, old system of AC current that is created by these dispatchable synchronous spinning turbines, these grid forming devices. And that's what makes everything work. This podcast we're doing right now, all energy is because of the system. Now, if you just start to interrupt it, and it's kind of like in a river, you dump a little water in the river, it doesn't matter dump some more water in the river. It doesn't matter. I mean, the water being dumped in the river has no velocity like the river. It doesn't know about the river's velocity. It's just dumped in the river. But now imagine you just start shoving water in this river. I mean, massive amounts of water. So, I mean, you're going to change the very nature of the, of the river. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's what started to happen. And the bottom line is that it actually created a situation where when it was sunny out, there'd be an enormous amount of solar effectively shoved into the grid, swimming in the grid. 
and a lot of that solar wasn't necessarily needed. So you start to have to pull back power plants. So you curtail power plants. You start to pull back gas and coal power plants. And the nukes, the nuclear power plants, which the Germans are not obviously very fond of, but even nukes are base load power plants. So they do base load. They're not doing the flexible load hmm. that's changing during the day anyway. And so nuclear power plants don't go up and down very fast and they can't. And so anyway, the gas power plants and the coal power plants start to curtail, curtail, curtail. First of all, you're putting a lot of stress on the grid just by shoving all that energy in. Yeah. It's windy or something. But secondly, now you're curtailing all these power plants. And here's the trick. When the sun goes down or the wind stops blowing, mm -hmm. then what? Right. Well, what you have to do is get all that energy back and you can't do it very quickly. Those power plants that curtailed are intermediate load power plants. They take hours. So the only way to do it is to fire the most expensive, dirty, peaking power plants, the most inefficient power plants, like jet engines, basically, to deal with the flexible load. And so the long story, very long, sorry, why Germany became such a big battery market and invented the battery business effectively for grid-tied storage is that, of course, this doesn't work because now you're adding new CO2 emissions into the system. It's like heartbreaking. Yeah. And you're, and it's expensive and dirty power. And, and okay, now you can recover with all these peaking power plants to go from what's called the belly of the duck to the head of the duck and what's mm. called the duck curve. Yeah. And then you can handle evening peak. So long story, very, very long, sorry. The solution to this is from a grid science perspective, very simple. It's been documented for decades. And actually the solution would have helped the regular grid even before renewables and electrification and EVs and all these new challenges would have helped the grid just in general in since 1920. Hmm. And of course, technology wasn't ready. And that's the ability to store energy, mm -hmm. the ability to balance and harmonize the grid. The only real renewable energy future is with intelligent energy storage and intelligent home systems and intelligent building systems. So the Germans adopted this very quickly and became the world leader in it. And Sonnen became one of the first pioneers of selling a battery that connects to the grid, that takes your solar, stores your solar, lets you use it later instead of shoving it in the grid, and actually helps you use it for not just your own home, but for the grid as a whole, and actually allows you to, to get rid of coal burning power plants. So the German energy system top 30% renewables and that's when the cost of electricity and the grid instability became a problem. And that's generally speaking what you see. If you go above 30% renewables, you start to see tremendous costs and instability and you need smart systems to take care of that. Well, did the addition of storage eventually then sort of stabilize the way Germany works? Um, just to stick with them for a minute before we shift yeah, into yeah. current day I in the US. My answers will be shorter now. I had to give you yeah. that foundation. No, that's that's very good. <laughs> I, 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 I I say to all my guests, I love when people talk because it's less time than I need to be the one oh, speaking. <laughs> well, no, so it started to for sure. So what's happened now is the – so, okay, prices in Germany surged. 20 cents, 30 cents, 40 euro cents a kilowatt hour. And a lot of it had to do with renewable energy and the wind. And then there's this particular problem in the North Sea with all this wind. And in the center of Germany, the transmission system that pushes energy from the north to the south, that transports shuttles energy from north to the south, was getting very clogged. And so you couldn't get the energy from the North Sea, where all the wind turbines were, to the south. I mean, this is obvious problems with renewable energy, right? When it was really windy. Hmm. And so you start getting all these costs. And then what ends up happening is, well, what are you going to do with all this energy? The solar and the wind. Well, we can curtail it. We can inject it into other countries. Hmm. So you start seeing the Germans push energy into Poland and paying the Polish to take it, which is weird, yeah. but is now the case in the United States. We have that in California now. And... And so it's like really a crazy thing. So they just increase prices. Now, the problem with the increased prices is the low income people are the ones who are most affected. If you're a high income person, you don't really care that much of your electric bill. I mean, you do, but your electric bill used to be $100 a month. Now it's 180. I mean, you don't like it, but why, well, whatever. Yeah. But if you're a low income person and you go from 100 to 180, 
This is massive. This is detrimental. Right. So what did the German government do? They passed taxes to subsidize the poor's electric bills. Hmm. Now we have that in California too now. And of course, that doesn't really solve anything because now you have more money going from other people in the country. To, anyway, it's just a transition, the transfer of wealth. And then you've got the ultimate problem, which is the lower middle income, because they don't get the subsidies and they're really in trouble. The, the electricity costs are really hurting them. And by the way, they're the ones paying this kind of subsidy for the solar, because if you have rooftop solar and you're shoving it into the grid, you're getting 200 percent of retail. And these people are, you know, who's paying that 200 percent of retail? Well, really, it's all of us all German citizens, but the, it was the lower middle income that were really feeling it. So it was a subsidy. And by the way, who gets to buy solar? It was people with money. Mm -hmm. You have to have a credit score. Germans are really tough on credit. Mm -hmm. And so so now, okay, I was telling you every farmer and everybody with a house, yeah, but they still have money. So the people with money all got solar, got this great program. Prices went up and the lower income people were paying for it. Well, everybody was paying for it, but the lower income people were really getting hurt by it. So they're yeah. subsidizing wealthy people solar. So it's just bananas. So what ended up happening is government started changing that feed in tariff instead of being 200% of retail, 150, 100, 50, 25%, zero. Wow. Now, if you get a new solar array in Germany, you're not getting anything for putting solar into the grid at all. In fact, you can get fined. And that is the natural evolution of grid science. The, what you have to do is have a battery and intelligently store the solar and then use it. And the battery can actually produce revenue for you if your home is smart enough. Very important point, because this will probably help the rest of our conversation. The home has to be smart enough. The solar has to be smart, not stupid. It has to be what's called dispatchable solar, meaning usable. Mm -hmm. It can't just flow because it's sunny. And to answer your question, yes, you know, the biggest energy storage market in the world even today it started to stabilize. The grid started to help the renewable energy penetration increase. Utility scale solar, CNI solar, I'm sorry, utility scale batteries, CNI batteries, residential batteries, smart batteries, virtual power plant programs where tens of thousands of batteries are swarm controlled and dispatched as if they were a single grid asset, just like a power plant would be. And, and even to stabilize a grid, not just for power and energy, batteries are really good for frequency, for voltage, for all the stuff you need for that grid of the future. It's even good when you're talking about electrification, broader sense, like electric vehicles and, and whatnot. So this started to stabilize things. Then, of course, just to fast forward, the war starts. Yeah. So this, you know, again, the subsidies really started to sunset in like, if I'm getting this right, like 2010, hmm. 2009. So basically Germany in general is 10 to 12 years ahead of California, you know, so depending on what metric you're looking at. So, you know, let's say 2010, 12, I think, is when the Anoya Bada and Tagitam Gazettes was changed and it was all these incentives for batteries and all these incentives for solar plus storage. And then the war starts in, of course, 2022. Mm -hmm. And the war changed everything. Energy prices soar again. Yeah. The natural gas that they buy from Gazprom that Angela Merkel was getting deals with Vladimir Putin on when solar was surging, right? Mm -hmm. Because those peaking power plants use natural gas. And like I told you, you need more net peaking power plants to handle the intermittent solar and wind. But once you have batteries, you have less and less need of that. So now there is a massive push because the electricity prices are high, extremely high, ridiculously high. To Americans, they wouldn't even make sense. Some of my colleagues pay 50 euro cents, 60 euro cents a kilowatt hour. So to compare that to like a low cost market in the United States, like Texas, like 6X mm -hmm. wow. power price. Can you imagine? No. So, and in some places in Italy, they're talking, they were talking crazy things. Now that's not probably going to happen now, but you may remember people were talking about in the winter, having the gas shortage that would cause people to have basically cold homes and now heat. And so this is when people were talking about one euro a kilowatt hour. These are, cra this is crazy talk, right? Mm -hmm. You would have revolution in America if this happened, I think. Yeah. But at any rate, the end of the story is that this has driven an entirely incredible new drive to that smart, clean energy grid of the future, that electrified energy system to get away from natural gas, to get away from gas power plants, to get, get away from the entire gas system, right? Mm -hmm. Electric heat pumps and uh, heat pumps for even your hot water, heat pumps, uh, and, and also electric heat or electric stoves instead of gas lines for your stove. So really trying to get away from the gas line 
trying to get away from gasoline vehicles. So effectively now in Germany, the market is a pull market. Can you imagine? It's crazy. It's a pull market for batteries. You don't, all we have to do is build more and we sell more. There's, there's a massive backlog, massive. We're going to build 60,000 units this year. We've only done 110,000 in our whole history. Wow. And the, the Shell would like us to really have a plan for a million batteries a year within a few years. And so this is what energy transition means for the battery space. It becomes a massive market and it is exploding as far as smart home as well. And this is a totally different world for, for Germany. Mm. So that's the full story about the German market. And if you want to know about the U.S. market and how that kind of is extremely unique and follows suit. <laughs> yeah, I want to I want to switch to the U.S. market next. But first, we're going to take a, a quick break from our conversation with Blake Ricketta. Do you want superior smart home automation at a great value? Shelly Wi-Fi relays by Alterco Robotics cover DC to line voltage, allowing you to control lights, outlets, appliances, garage doors, pumps, and much more. There are Shelly sensors and power measurement devices to help you measure temperature, humidity, lux, or motion, and electrical consumption from single wire to three phase with neutral. You can use Shelly with a licensed driver for Control 4, Elon, or other premium systems, as well as your customer's existing hub, voice assistant, or any platform that accepts REST, MQTT, or CoAP. Shelly can make IoT very easy. Available now at Blackwire, City Electric Supply, and Worthington, or at ShellyUSA.com. Welcome back. I'm talking with Sonnen Chairman and CEO, Blake Ricketta. Um, so let's switch. We had covered the German background and how far ahead they are to, from the U.S., but you're focused on the, the U.S. And early on in your your time with um, Sonnen, there was a, a big uh, success for the company with the uh, Mandalay Homes project in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Can you talk about what uh, that meant for Sonnen and what it meant for it's sort of a proof of concept of what could happen in the U.S. market. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so we came to the U.S. with this idea again of, look, I told you about the German story. It has to be a, a grid-optimized battery that makes solar smart. It's not just backup power. In this country, Powerwall was just being positioned as backup power and maybe somehow it was going to help fight climate change, but through a daily cycle. And it was very vague. And in the United States, it was in 2016, very vague exactly how energy storage was going to play a role, even though everybody knew energy storage was the future. But how do you do that, practically speaking? So we did not come in with some illusion that we were going to compete on backup power with Tesla. And we knew the Generac, which is a massive American gas generator backup company, was going to get into batteries. And so, look, backup power is like, OK, it's really important. Resiliency is important, but this is not our thing. I mean, we're trying to actually fight climate change. Right. So to support your point, Literally, <laughs> literally, there was this conference, this tech home builder conference that I always enjoyed when I was at Lutron. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Tesla, I thought, you know what? I'll take Tesla to tech home builder because I really would like to do some master plan communities. And we've been talking to Lennar. And so we thought, you know, this is a good idea. So I put this agreement in Tesla's name and then I left Tesla and it never at Tesla, you need my boss's boss, JB Straubel, the chief technology officer would have had to actually execute. The, and so he didn't. Do, and the point is. Tesla's agreement didn't go through. Hmm. And when I changed over to Sony, and I wasn't even an employee yet, and I asked our future director of marketing at Sony in the US, hey, could you get us into this show, Tech Home Builder? Hmm. And she's like, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> so we go into this Tech Home Builder, and I make a speech. It was my second day on the job. First day on the job, I go up in North, Northern California to Actually, there was a debate with Tesla, which is, which is weird. It's just a freaky, your first day in the job. <laughs> and then the second day in the job, I went to Tech Home Builder and I made a speech. And in the front, there was this gentleman named Jeff Farrell. And he was the chief technology officer of this incredible little production home builder. I say little in production, right? So not a custom home builder, production home builder. They do typically two, 300 houses a year in northern Arizona called Mandalay Homes. And he comes to me after the presentation in so many words and says, I'm paraphrasing. This is what we've been waiting for. We need to talk. So he was very forward thinking. He was already getting awards from the United States Department of Energy. Hmm. They already were being recognized by very senior level people in the DOE. Sam Rashkin, of course, being one of the most famous ones. And 
And he wanted to create something better than solar. There was solar was already kind of a thing in the United States, of course, but the idea of solar, it, it just we had net metering in this country, so never did the 200% retail thing. America never went that nuts like the Germans did with their huge pendulum swing. We had this 100% of retail net metering. So you put a kilowatt hour into the grid, it's the same price as if you pull it out of the grid. So there's no reason to store your energy in, in America. Really, in 2016, wasn't very much of an economical thing to do. Mm. But this guy, Jeff Farrell, was already reading these grid science articles and grid architecture articles and getting into the energy system business. And what we, when, in my industry, they call grid wonks, the equivalent of you, Jeremy, that are going around interviewing these grid wonks. Canary Media and Clean Technica and things like this. Anyway, so they, you know, he's looking at the kind of the this grid wonk space, and he's like, "Man, a home needs to be smart. It needs to have solar. It needs to have a smart electric vehicle charger, mm-hmm. and it needs to have a battery to manage it all. This is the only way energy transition is going to work. Everything else in home building is, <laughs> in his mind, was was less important. So he starts building this concept with me." of a master plan. Now, by the way, the Germans are not really into big master plan communities. It's not their thing. It's Mm. a very American thing. Okay. Right. Big, massive home builders. And just, just, I guess us and the Chinese like to overbuild anyway. (laughs) Well, we have more available land. Maybe is that part of why? Yeah. Well, I think that's one thing. And there's a lot of other things in our culture where we just, you know, build homes (laughs) on debt and on speculation. And the Chinese have followed suit in their Henry Ford production model, you know, continues. That's exactly right. Yeah. But the Germans are more conservative. They're like, oh, do you really need this house here? Yeah. So Mandalay Homes was working on a master plan community, 2,900 homes, which if you know how their size, you know, it's going to take them like 12, 15 years. Hmm. And it's a gorgeous community in northern Arizona. It's a groundbreaking community called Jasper. And he wanted to make a Sonin a standard specification in every single home like a countertop, like not a, not an option and make the son and run the home. And back then I was, you know, still very fresh from Lutron. So I had all these grandiose ideas of how I was going to someday, I saw this glaringly obvious gap between smart home and energy transition. I'm like, okay, what are you doing for smart home? And he's like, ah, you know, bleh. at least I was able to get him over to control four. Hmm. And that was helpful. I mean, I wanted him to do Lutron of course, but from a, basically just from a home automation perspective and, so he starts to look at more technologies. We say, okay, let's tie this all together, solar battery control for, and let's do a smart home that will also control an EV charger that will be more than just solar. Because when you really look at CO2 reduction, solar by itself, as I explained to you earlier in the interview, actually hits a wall and doesn't continue to decarbonize the planet. It actually hits a plateau and then can recarbonize it, which is crazy. Yeah. So... He wanted to show true decarbonization, true net zero, net zero carbon emissions, not net zero energy, which doesn't mean anything, but producing as much as you consume. And wow, you know, he was a revolutionary and we went with APS, the utility, and said, hey, can we have a price signal, a time of use rate that would make it so that it's a really smart thing to store our solar, offset the peak period where it's expensive, dirty energy in the system anyway, and by the way, he was radical. Mandalay, Mandalay was radical for their time. Now it's just coming to light how radical. I'll tell you that in a minute. But the, the idea was, Jeff's idea was, why do I just solar time shift the solar from the roof and put it in the battery? Why don't I charge from the grid? Because at 2 o'clock in the morning, there's all this excess generation in the grid that just flows and no load, and it's cheap and clean nuclear power. Like, why wouldn't I also charge from the grid and time shift that against peak periods where it's congested dirty energy and that'll make the grid more efficient and decarbonize it. And by the way, this is Arizona. People have all this solar shoved in the grid. Duck curve. Remember the duck curve. There's all this extra solar. Why don't I, he called it solar harvesting, which I can't believe this term was never used in Europe yet. So why don't I swarm charge all the batteries in the Jasper community from the grid when the utility says there's excess solar in the grid? Okay. Because remember, I told you, otherwise you have to curtail the solar. You have to push it to another market or you have to curtail power plants. Yeah. And the energy prices in the wholesale market go negative when that happens. Mm-hmm. So and there's examples of that in Germany, both wind and solar, where there's too much wind. And what are you going to do with this? You push it to Poland or too much solar. And what are you going to do with it? It's two o'clock in the morning or it's two in the afternoon. Right. So anyway, in America, we have that now in California. So long story long, what ended up happening was 
<laughs> we got this amazing price. Back then, we, didn't, we were kind of stupid. I was still kind of a Lutron guy. What did I know? I mean, I was one year at Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know. I was not an energy systems expert in any way. I'm, I was like, oh, yeah, this is sounds good. We didn't know that we had stumbled on a first of its kind in the country by far, where the batteries charge from the grid during certain hours that the price signal said, hey, charge from the grid. It's going to be really, really cheap because there's all this extra solar. So please take it. And then you could charge in the middle of the night from the grid as well, from the nuclear power, for instance, and you offset your peak periods. And by the way, there's this thing called demand charges in the energy industry, which it's not the kilowatt hour, it's a kilowatt. So if you have a surge of power, the utility basically pegs your surge of power for a second and say, look, you use this much power for a second. Guess what, buddy? You're going to pay this big fee for the month Mm -hmm. because you're using such a large, it's about the capacity of the wires in the energy system. It's not about the kilowatt hour. It's the the capacity, the space in the wire. So that's called demand charge. If you look on your electric bill, most residential bills don't have demand charges in this country, but in commercial buildings, they all do. Okay. So you've got, yeah, so you've got demand charges for the kilowatt, and then you've got your price per kilowatt hour. So we ask APS, the utility, to make it so we could also get rid of the demand charges because they were already putting demand charges in Arizona for residential applications. So he said, look, make it so if we don't go above a certain kilowatt surge ever, pulling from the grid, there's no demand charges. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to charge from the grid when it's super cheap, offset peak period, and we're going to take the solar from the grid, and we're going to put that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, solar from the roof, put that in the battery, and offset peak period as well. And by the way, this is a very complicated algorithm, yikes. So Sonin went forward with Jeff Farrell's advice to write an algorithm to manage all these things. (laughs) And it's called the optimi- optimized time of use algorithm. And to fast forward to today, just for a second, wow, Jeremy, like we just got the patent issued last year, finally from the U.S. Patent Office on the optimized time of use algorithm from Mandalay Holmes. And that puts us in a really special position now in California, which is an exploding market and a massive market. And then let's see, he won like, I think, goodness, seven awards. Mm for these innovations but it what but it was hard for the department of energy even to get their arms around how radical this was it was kind of this thing ahead of its time yeah so wouldn't you know it wasn't until last year or was it 2021 it might have been 2021 we did this in 2016 we did this in 2017 so in 2021 finally they got mandalay got the award for the most grid optimized and grid optimized renewable home in the country Grid optimized renewable smart home in the country. Okay. I believe is the exact title. I have to look at the exact title. And this was awarded by Secretary Granholm, who works for President Biden, directly to Mandalay Homes. And would you know that by that point in time, Jeff Farrell had already left Mandalay Homes to come work for me. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. And so Jeff Farrell, who now is vice president of the virtual power plant business at Sonin, because he got so passionate about it, got to look where Secretary Granholm gave this award on behalf of President Biden to his old boss. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So Mandalay was something transformative for us and for the American market. And uh, so you've had some other successes um, since then. And, uh, and I, to name a couple, uh, Soleil Lofts in wow, Salt Lake good City. For you. Good for yeah, you. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and also... Um, and, and and just working with Rocky Mountain Power, I, I've read some quotes from you that say how Rocky Mountain Power really is has been kind of like an I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but like an ideal utility partner for um, the energy transition. Can you explain why they've been so so helpful versus um, project down in Florida, which maybe not so easy? Uh, well, that's to work a great with. question. Yeah, thank you. So after Mandalay, we had to figure out how to go to the next level, and Rocky Mountain Power was the next level for me. I was promoted to senior vice president to run the U.S. company instead of just doing sales, which was hard. I had to figure out that my whole career had been in sales and figure out that whole dynamic. But we knew we needed to have a keystone partnership to take this to the next level. And we also knew we wanted to get into various different markets and new construction, master plan communities was one. But ultimately, we want the vast consumer market, too. Yeah. Where just everybody who's considering buying solar or buying an electric car, which is going to be, you know, tens of millions of people in the future. So we honed in on, and when I, so we got acquired in 2019, we formed the American board and I became chairman and CEO of the company. And it was around that time we were already honed in on this radical 
another radical <laughs> pioneering. Yeah, this it's required, I guess, in these situations. Developer and property owner called Wasatch Group. And Wasatch Group is very well known in the Utah market. The CEO of Wasatch Group, Deloitte Hansen, is a very well known leader, a billionaire in the market there. He owns many properties, many companies, hotels, buildings, restaurants, office spaces, and communities. And he really wanted to make a difference in the world in the last part of his career. So he's 65 or so. And so he wanted to really make a difference that was going to help for his children and grandchildren. And in the Wasatch Front, they have real problems with clean air because they have these amazing mountains. If you've ever been to Utah for skiing, you know the mountains are great, but effectively you have in the middle all this air that can just get trapped by the mountains. Hmm. So pollution is something that really they live in Utah when it's bad and they know what it does to their clean air. So the beauty of this was he wanted to build this perfect clean energy community that would prove his mandate, prove his thesis on we can do better and we can make the Wasatch Front's air better for our children and grandchildren. And he knew that he needed a battery. Just again, if you read anything in the kind of the energy industry or the grid science space, you know that if you just do solar alone, you're not doing anything mm -hmm. for a long-term future. So he knew he needed a battery. So it worked out perfectly because he was looking at all these different batteries to use with this new community called Soleil Lofts. Of course, in French, the word Soleil for sun. And he wanted this to be a community that became a blueprint to the future and an apartment community. And he wanted solar and battery for every single apartment. Long story long, we spent an enormous amount of time trying to win that partnership and that specification. And he was flown by Tesla to Tesla headquarters in Palo Alto and Fremont to see in a gigafactory to, to, to do this with him. And, and he went to some other companies as well. And can you believe it? He chose Sonin. And we did this amazing thing, a standard battery in every single apartment, 600 apartments, but it doesn't stop there. Deloitte wanted to make a real blueprint for the future. So you can't just do solar and battery and, you know, defect from the grid and say that that's going to be the blueprint for society. So he, because he's a very influential guy in Utah, he engaged the utility Rocky Mountain Power. And Rocky Mountain Power, very Utah-like, they are conservative, but so practical. Mm. So practical. And it, so they wanted to engage. They wanted to understand the concept here. And they were already really forward thinking on renewable energy. It's like tons of utility scale solar and wind and mostly in the northern parts of their territory around Wyoming and whatnot. So basically, we engaged with Rocky Mountain Power. They helped craft the idea of the distributed battery grid management system for Utah and how they would use our software much like in Germany, but very American, very American way of doing it to steer all the batteries at Soli Lofts. But they did not want to stop at Soli Lofts. They wanted to make it because to them, Soli Lofts is nice, but it's one apartment community when you're talking about gigawatts, OK, not megawatts. And you need a much bigger landscape for Rocky Mountain Power to see it as anything meaningful. So Soli Lofts became a crowning achievement for us because it was a first in the world clean energy carbon neutral, totally electric, no gas, utility controlled master plan apartment community. And that was great. But Rocky Mountain Power wanted to move forward past that. So we got all the press and all the industry around the country saying, oh, my goodness, what has Sonin done with this Soleil Lofts? It's so much more. I mean, we're doing tons of grid services, way more than Mandalay Homes, dynamically changing the battery state every day with software that the utility controlled. Whereas Arizona, it was just a really cool time of use rate mm -hmm. is not the utility pushing buttons every day with our software. So not only did Soleil Lofts completely change the space in the United States, but it was expanded to WattSmart. Yeah. So w with the WattSmart program, do you have to have the solar ingredient or can you just store off the grid into the battery? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. It shows that you're really thinking this through too, man, because this is the true potential of the battery. It's like the Swiss Army knife of energy transition, right? When you think about all the things it can do. Yeah. So at first it was, look, do solar and battery. Now Rocky Mountain Power is saying, hey, how about all those existing solar arrays out there? There's 60,000 in Utah that don't have a battery. Could you just go put a battery into this home with the solar to stop 
the solar disaster and make the solar something usable and smart and awesome for the grid. So now they're incentivizing even higher if you already own solar and you add a battery. And then, yes, the third piece now, because of the Inflation Reduction Act passed by President Biden last year, we now have the ability to basically people can still get the full tax credit and not have solar. Hmm. This is very, very big deal for the United States because in our country, it was weird. I shouldn't say weird, but it was un- unfortunate. You had to have solar. You couldn't get the tax credit on the battery. Mm-hmm. Now you can. Okay. And so now you can just get a battery and that would be an incentive as well. So it's really created a market for people who want clean energy, carbon neutral living, backup power resiliency. They want to be part of something great in the future, but they want their home to be smarter and their solar to be smarter. Well, you know, we've, we've talked for, uh, about an hour going on an hour and that's, that's a long time for me to have you on. And we've covered a lot, but there's a lot we haven't covered. Um, one of the areas I really wanted to touch on since our audience is the CI channel typically, uh, is the opportunity for a CDA integrator who, who wants to take their smart home knowledge and work on the energy transition in some regard. And you and I spoke offline about this and you said really the opportunity is for a whole new business model. So what, what can you say about those companies that really want to be progressive in a, a new business model, maybe a subsidiary of their existing smart home integration company uh, to get into uh, working with, um, you know, battery backup, battery. Um, <laughs> optimized batteries. Yeah, yeah. Op- optimized battery, not battery backup. I got it. <laughs> no, backup's fine. We got, and there's other companies in the CI channel doing backup power, right? That's a yeah. great question, Jeremy. So yeah, I think just to capstone the conversation we had before, maybe you end up dividing this into two. I don't know. But so, because this will help with the answer to your question. So it's not just Utah anymore. So what's happened is California has basically followed the same steps as Germany. And if you look in the news, in the solar industry news, you'll see this crazy thing called NEM3, net metering 3.0. Oh, my God, NEM3. And everybody's freaking out about it. And the solar industry's freaking out about it. My, what, Don't touch my solar jobs, they say, and all this nonsense. And this is the same thing we saw in Germany and Italy and Japan and Australia. It's playing again and again. The industry is in a situation, and people don't get it, right? Because it's like Americans say funny things like, well, how is it that DeSantis just signed net meterings extension in Florida and they're a red state and we're supposed to be the clean energy state in California. We're trying to kill solar. We're not trying to kill solar. It's that Florida doesn't have a duck curve yet. Solar is nothing in Florida. It's it's one tiny little rounding error of their energy so they can do net metering. It doesn't matter. California is over 36% renewable now. And so we're past that mark. Costs are soaring. Our grid is unstable. We have the Western imbalance market, the WIM where during the day in the summer, we're shoving solar into Utah, Nevada, and Arizona and paying them to take it. Mm -hmm. We're curtailing. We're doing all this stuff I told you about that the Germans experienced in 2010. So what does that mean? It means that NEM3 creates a new market. Smart home and smart batteries are absolutely on the brink of exploding in California for energy transition. You can't just buy, as of May of this year, Buying solar and putting on your roof in California, like everybody likes to do, will become financially silly. Mm. You would need a smart battery and you would need to participate in a market and have that battery do cool things. And maybe you buy an EV charger and you have an electric vehicle as well. This is also going to happen in Texas, which is a totally different story, but it's going to happen in Texas. Much lower electricity prices, but Texas has a real problem with massive amounts of wind generation and they have a lot of opportunity. And then other states like New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut will follow suit. And then you'll see crazy opportunities like Florida, maybe linger, like you mentioned, we have master plan communities all over the country, Florida, Michigan, Chicago, and they're in some cases in markets where it makes no sense to have a smart battery yet, like Florida, but the home builder still does it because they want to be innovative and pioneering. So for integrators, and I I always go back to the story you and I talked about offline where it, it really touches me. I think about it all the time. Before I came to Lutron, just a few years before is when Lutron first went to Cedia, right? In the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And the stories from one of my mentors, Michael Smith and David Weinstein, and even Rick Angel, these guys talked about how, I'm paraphrasing, of course, it was such a strange thing because the CI channel thought, why on earth is this high voltage company coming to Cedia? They should go to, you know, the electrician show. Wrong show, guys. 
mm-hmm. was kind of the thing. There's no reason for a lighting company to come to Cedia. And you fast forward and Lutron, I believe, pioneered an entire category for the Cedia space that I think over time has become one of the most important categories for that CI channel, the lighting control space. And nobody, I, well, I don't know how many people think back to those old days where companies would have thought, even the Crestrons of the world would have thought that it, back then it was AMX, you know, Elon, and that Lutron was, was goofy. The same thing happened again from my mentor, David Weinstein, when he brought, after we bought Vimco with a crazy idea Mr. Spira had that automated window treatments would control the visual environment in a home better than just having pulley shades and automated lighting control for, with dimmers. And so we, we pioneered this thing called automated shades. And again, back then in 2001, 2002, the CDA channel again, so many people, I remember I was there to paraphrasing, but what do you think? We're interior designers. What are we decorators? What are you talking about? Fast forward and Lutron once again, created a category. Integrators eventually got on board. Energy transition is a little different, but I think is way, way bigger than the opportunities Lutron ever presented or than any, any opportunities ever been presented to the CDA channel. But at the same time, it's highly likely that a tiny minority of integrators will ever get on this bandwagon before it becomes a multi-trillion dollar global industry. So it's never been the case before that smart home technology was so essential to the very fabric of electricity. It wasn't. It's always been a fun, cool thing. And the problem with fun, cool things is the integrator does well in the high-end market, but the rest of the market is you know, the lower end and middle class market end up just being sort of a mass market of apps and you know your iPhone and, and some basic little products. Now what you're seeing is something different. The energy system needs this. And there's hundreds of billions of dollars that will be invested in it as part of the infrastructure of the grid. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about solar becoming smart with a smart battery. And I'm talking about electric vehicle chargers because, hello, if we all got electric vehicles tomorrow, the entire grid would go down. The grid Mm -hmm. would not be able to handle electric vehicles, this electrification vision that now is becoming policy in California and the European Union is scientifically impossible mm. with the grid that we have today and, the, and the, the dumb homes that we have today. And then you've got things like heat pumps and other major loads, electric, so air conditioning, thermostats, lighting a little bit, but yeah, I mean, lighting is still my heart in some way, but <laughs> the energy perspective, you know, not a huge load for the home. So, We must have a home energy management system. This is not a debate. We must. And in my industry, there are so many talks, billions of dollars being thrown around on how this is going to be accomplished. And when I first talked to Troy Morgan about this from Pantech, Mm -hmm. you know, this guy, you should have him on your show. This guy, this guy started getting fired up and I'm like, okay, I'm glad you're fired up because I'm fired up. And, and so I start bringing them into meetings and Jeremy, it was eye opening. People are like utility companies, like saying things like this guy's brilliant. I can't <laughs> believe this technology already exists. Utility companies that can put billions of dollars into an initiative if they want to hundreds of millions at the very least. And then he's going into meetings with energy wonks and solar industry people. And he's not trying to say he's an expert in solar, but he's like, look, let me tell you a little bit about Crestron. Hmm. People say, what's Crestron? Right. And he's like, well, yeah. we can do all the things you want to do. You want to measure the electricity, to all the loads, not a problem. You could do that now. Could you actually flex the loads and change the loads based on conditions? I mean, I hate to say it, but in some cases, Troy would walk out of meetings and I'm paraphrasing saying, this is not that hard for us to do. And people uh-huh. are acting like it's rocket science. So long story long, once one last time in our multiple interview here, what Troy ended up doing is creating an entire business model, launching Adapt Energy, working with Crestron to internalize that into the Crestron system, into Crestron Home. And now you've got, I mean, the guys sold literally thousands of batteries and you've got utility companies trying to talk to them about doing deals. 
that would include whole demand response programs for thousands of homes. You've got integrators interested in his technology. And so what did you find here? That Pantech Design and now Adapt Energy is a brand known in the energy industry. You see Savant following suit with Race Point Energy. It's now Savant Energy. They're showing up in our shows, okay? SPI, now RE+. Plus, okay, this is the, the CEDIA of my industry, 30,000-person sh show. And you got these companies like Savant and Adapt Energy showing up to the show. So let's, let me put it, break it down this way. If an integrator wanted to launch a different business that is totally different, I'm not talking about selling energy automation to the affluent market. There's nothing wrong with that, and that's cool. That is not an energy transition thing because that's right. just a tiny percentage of people. If they wanted to look at going broad market and taking their years of being a CD integrator, their superior technology knowledge, and offering it to the energy industry, to home builders, mass production home builders, to utility companies, and of course, to solar contractors. To give you an example, one of my solar contractors does, a, and this is a top contractor, but just to give you an idea, does 400 sonins a month, wow. 400 homes. In every one of those homes, they wish they had a basic smart home solution for sonin, the solar, and the EV charger, at least, and the thermostat to talk. Mm. And they don't. Mm -hmm. You've got companies like Baker Home Energy in San Diego doing hundreds of homes a month. And then you've got the big boys like Sunrun who are tens of thousands of homes a month. But that's a, those are the the giants. Yeah. So could an integrator like Troy, and, and maybe it's as easy as people understanding that Troy's platform exists. I mean, from what I understand, it's not like a recognized platform in Crestron Home. So Adapt Energy is. To recognize the technology, look at it a little bit. Sonin could bring you in to mm -hmm. meet a solar contractor starving for this. Right. And then a demand response incentive, a utility program. Are you going to be at the table of the utility company and a solar contractor? Is that the weirdest thing you've ever imagined in your life as a CD integrator? Maybe. But Troy did it and he was fine. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. rested on the laurels of his background. He never claimed to be a solar expert. But I'll give you one last story as an example. When you're talking about solar inverters, okay, this is an inverter. This inverts direct current from the solar panel to usable AC current in the home. Right. But that inverter is pretty darn important. But that inverter is not, is not nearly as smart as it should be. And utilities need that inverter to be smarter and to talk to the battery and to talk to the EV charger and to create some programming to manage all of that. And I would love to give the industry, maybe even just because I have an emotional connection to it, this one last invitation. Look, I was Lutronite for 15 years. You, they always say you can take the Lutronite out of Lutron, but not Lutron out of the Lutronite. So, okay, I'll always have Lutron in my blood, even though Sonin is, of course, where I've really, I think, achieved my calling. But we'll open the door to utility companies, to solar contractors, to home builders, production home builders, not custom home builders, who want to build the smart energy home of the future. And if you want to bring your technology and your wherewithal, maybe you just use Adapt Energy, maybe just use Savant. They've got that whole platform. We would bring you into the business relationships and I would be proud to do it because it's from my heritage. <laughs> That's amazing. What a great invitation and opportunity for the channel and such a... Um, awesome education on on this whole energy transition um yeah. potential and where it's at where it's going um like i really appreciate the time i think we could talk for another hour and cover even more <laughs> ground right. honestly this is a two-part interview <laughs> <laughs> well we'll see how we break it up but I, I do appreciate it and and look forward to continuing to to keep keep pace with what's going on with, with sonnen and and the whole market opportunity so thanks for your time and insights today Thank you, Jeremy. Let's make electrons clean and smart, and maybe let's do it with the CI channel. Thanks so much for your time, and I hope to work with you again in the future. It's always such a pleasure, Jeremy. Blake Ricketta is the chairman and CEO at the global energy storage company, Sonnen. You can learn more about his company at sonnenusa.com. And that wraps up today's show. 
Special thanks to Pretty Easy Podcast for producing and editing this episode. If you're new to Residential Tech Talks, please subscribe to the weekly podcast on your preferred platform and consider rating or reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Also, check out all the latest residential tech news at the magazine's website, restechtoday.com, where you can subscribe to the print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Friday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell. Let's get charged, Jeremy!